Next, we will look at shear stress in moving fluid. Shear stress in moving fluid is very important because it is actually the shear stress that actually causes uh, fluid resistance that resists the flow of fluids. So in order to understand uh, how the shear stress develop in uh, moving fluids, let's say we have a flat plate. And then there is flow coming from this side, right? So at the wall itself, the velocity will be equal to zero. So we call this no slip conditions. Okay, but away from the wall, there will be a finite velocity. So if I, if I draw a graph of, so let's say this is velocity, this is y, okay? So at the wall itself, the velocity will be zero, whereas away from the wall, it will have a, uh, some value of finite velocity. So there will be a, a velocity gradient like that. So far from the wall, you will have higher velocity, whereas closer to the wall, the velocity will gradually reduce to zero here. Right, the velocity will be slightly higher, compared to this point here. So I just take a small element of fluids like that, and then I'm going to consider what happens to that element when the fluids start to flow. So let's say I draw this element. Okay, so I call this point A, point B, point C, and point D. So before the fluids flow, this is what the elements uh, looks like, right? So when the fluid starts to flow, what will happen is that the upper layer here will be moving at a velocity, at a higher velocity, right? So V plus delta V, whereas the bottom layer is moving at a velocity V, right? So this one would have moved slightly further distance, so become A dash, this one's C dash, and then V dash, and then V dash. So the element will be elongated. Like that. Right. Right. So I would like to get the expression for uh, shear strain rate. Let's consider the net, net elongations. So net elongations will be a dash b dash minus a b, right? And then minus c dash d dash minus c d. That's the net elongations. So what is this value equal to? Okay, so if you look at this one here, will be equal to v plus delta v delta t, right? Because the velocity multiplied by time, so we get uh, the elongations. So we minus that with uh, the bottom part, velocity will be v, so v delta t, right? So that is actually equal to delta v delta t, right? So from there, having obtained the net elongation, I can now get the expression for net shear strain will be net elongations okay, divided by this thickness. So let's call that one uh, delta y. Okay, so delta y, right? So this is delta v delta t divided by delta y. Okay, I can obtain now net shear strain rate which it is actually equal to the net shear strain, which is delta V, delta T over delta Y. And then since it's straight divided by delta T, so that is actually equal to delta V over delta Y. If I let now delta Y equals to zero, in a limit where delta y 
equals to zero of delta V over delta Y. So what I obtain is basically it's just dV by dy. So what is dV by dy? dV dy is actually this is one over velocity gradient. So meaning that if I consider this, the gradient there, for example, this is actually equal to dy by dv, right? That's dy by dv. So shear strain rate is dv by dy, so it's 1 over dy by dv, right? For fluids which obey NLV, which is called Newton's law of viscosity, Newton's found out that shear stress is proportional to shear strain rate or shear stress is tau is proportional to dv by dy. So now if I plot the graph of shear stress against dv by dy, since it's proportional, what I will get is actually a straight line like that, right? And the gradient here is constant since it's proportional. This is what we actually call mu or viscosity. So we can write that equation which says that tau is equal to mu dv by dy. So to recall, Newton observed experimentally that shear stress is proportional to shear strain rate. And we have shown just now that shear strain rate is equal to 1 over velocity gradient or dv by dy. Right? So we have the Newton's law of viscosity, which says that uh, shear stress is proportional to shear strain rate. And the constant of proportionality is dynamic viscosity. So dynamic viscosity is actually the measure of fluid's resistance to shear when there is relative motions within the fluid. So fluid which has higher viscosity will have higher resistance to flow compared to fluid which has lower uh, viscosity. If we take uh, the dynamic viscosity and divide that with the density, then we obtain what is called the kinematic viscosity, nu. There are two mechanisms that are responsible for shear stress in fluids. First of all, intermolecular bonding within the fluid, and the second one is momentum transfer uh, within the fluids. Let us consider the momentum transfer within the fluid. If we envisage the fluid uh, consisting of uh, different layers, let's consider two layers of fluid. The upper layer here is moving at a higher velocity compared to the lower layer here. So whenever there is momentum transfer, for example, from the upper layer, which is moving at a faster velocity, to the lower layer, which is moving at a lower velocity, the net effect will be, it will try to pull the lower layer together with it and cause it to move faster. Uh, conversely, whenever there is a mass being transferred from the lower layer, which is actually a low velocity, to the upper layer, which is uh, moving at the higher velocity, the net effect will be, it will try to slow down the, uh, the upper layer. Right, so let us consider now these two mechanisms. So we can write viscosity of, of fluid is actually caused by intermolecular, intermolecular plus the one which is caused by momentum transfer. So in liquid, in liquid, the intermolecular mechanism is dominant, whereas in gas, the momentum transfer is dominant. Right. So if we consider the 
the mechanism which is due to intermolecular as temperature increases what will happen is that the intermolecular bonding will be weaker right and because of that the viscosity due to intermolecular bonding will also reduce whereas for my momentum transfer as the temperature increases the mechanisms will become more dominant so momentum transfer because of that if we observe how viscosity varies with temperature in liquid and gas it behaves differently so for liquid since intermolecular mechanism is actually more significant as temperature increase what will happen is that the mu for liquid will reduce whereas for gas as temperature increases the viscosity will increase right so if we were to, to plot the graph for gas so this is viscosity against temperature so what you see is that it will increase with temperature and for liquid it will reduce with temperature okay so which is shown in this graph here right so for air for example the viscosity increases with uh, temperature whereas for uh, crude oil which is a liquid the viscosity reduces with uh, temperature so viscosity varies with uh, temperature the actual values of uh, viscosity can be obtained from the chart which is available in the appendix of the textbook which is actually shown on this uh, the two graph here so on the left are the dynamic viscosity so we can see here this is the value of viscosity in the on the y-axis and then temperature is on the x-axis so here we have a few uh, liquid so you can see for all the liquid the viscosity is actually reduces with uh, temperature and whereas for uh, gases the viscosity increases with temperature so using this chart here you can obtain the actual value of dynamic viscosity at different temperature for example at 20 degrees c for um, sae 30w oil so 20 degrees c you can go this way and then you can obtain the value here so the value of viscosity is 4 times 10 to the minus 1 right whereas for example for uh, glycerin for glycerin say at this temperature also 20 degrees c for glycerin the value is 1.5 on the right hand side uh, this is a chart for kinematic viscosity so kinematic viscosity is dynamic viscosity divided by the density so kinematic viscosity is also functions of temperature so using this chart you can easily obtain the value of viscosity of uh, a few typical uh, liquid and gases so fluids that obey the newton's law of viscosity is called newtonian fluids whereas there are many fluids which do not obey the newton's law of viscosity and these fluids are called non-newtonian fluids there are many examples of non-newtonian fluids for example blood slurries etc so for Newtonian fluid, if you draw the graph of tau uh, against dv by dy, it is actually a straight line. And then since the viscosity is constant, so the gradients are actually constants. So there are many uh, other fluids which doesn't obey Newton's law of viscosity. For example, we have a fluid which is called shear thinning fluids, uh, whereby 
when the shear stress increases, the, the fluid will behave like a, a fluid. Whereas when the shear stress is, is low, it uh, behaves like a, almost like a solid and is very difficult to, to move. So that fluid is called shear thinning or pseudoplastic. Right. Example of pseudoplastic or shear thinning fluids are, for example, ketchup, quicksand, whereas another type of fluid is called shear thickening fluid or dilatant fluids. So the behavior is such that when the shear stress increases, the viscosity increases. And even when the shear stress is, is very high, the fluids can behave even like a solid. So this is called shear thickening or dilatant uh, uh, fluid. Right? And we also have uh, Bingham plastics, whereby the behavior is such that uh, when the shear stress is, is low, it behaves almost like a solid, and then it's elastic up to the point whereby there is threshold of uh, value of shear stress. And after that, it will start to flow. That is called Bingham plastics. Then we also have ideal fluid. For ideal fluid, there is no shear stress at all. So the gradient of shear stress against shear strain rate is zero. So that is uh, ideal fluid. Let us look at uh, a video which shows us the shear thickening or the latent fluid. This is an example of fluid which doesn't obey Newton's law of viscosity.